there's some more work towards remedying that if we end up in two rooms again like that. Yeah, and I'll, um, I believe we'll be trying to get back to normal this summer in the rooms, but uh, uh, hopefully that will happen soon. Representative Collins. Uh, sorry, just a, <laughs> just thought of it. Uh, I know you're trying to uh, close the comment section, but uh, I was just wondering about the, um, and it really, I think you mentioned a little bit about it, um, like people that want to testify to a committee, whatever it, uh, you know, saves them, uh, you know, be able to do it remotely, saves them from having to come all the way from, say, western Kansas here, just, you know, maybe talk 10 or 15 minutes, it will take them all day to get here and back. Uh, get back home. So uh, I guess that's something that's going to be uh, uh, offered in the again in the future. Uh, the you know remote testimony kind of thing. We will have the technology in place to do those things. It'll be up to leadership and the chairs to decide. I think to how they want to work their committees. But uh, I think we have that opportunity to allow those those people to come in and well, that, remotely and do that. Well, that's great. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Anybody else? Thank you, Alan. Uh, so Terry's next. Yeah, I'll have Terry next. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, committee members. Thanks for having us here today. I uh, will walk through the technical services team's presentation and just hit the highlights of this. Um, you have the written report. It's organized into uh, projects that are currently in progress, upcoming projects, and projects that we've completed uh, since your last meeting. So our projects that are currently in progress, uh, we are wrapping up the legislator laptop lease. Uh, you did receive new laptops in January, and um, we have been wiping the off-lease laptops and preparing those for shipping. So those will be going out in just a couple of weeks. We're still updating servers to Windows Server 2019. That work should be completed in July. The network switches were upgraded by OITS prior to the start of the legislative session, and they're going through now and enabling some security options on the switches. We, um, as part of the teleconferencing project, we also upgraded all of the audio systems in the building, and um, Alan covered the Cisco WebEx system implementation. We still have some outstanding work on that, some mopping up to do in conference rooms, and the classroom and auditorium in the visitor center. So that should be completed in the next two, three weeks. Upcoming projects, um, we're expanding the rubric backup system. When that system was put in, we sized it for a three-year data capacity. We're four years at it, and we are really pushing the boundaries on capacity. So um, that will be upgraded in June. The House chamber uh, display boards for the voting systems will also be upgraded in June. That scaffolding will be put up early next week and will be up throughout the month of June while those boards are being replaced. Those will be replaced with LED display boards, 1.9 millimeters, so the lights are very close together. So we'll have higher resolution for the text um, hopefully it won't be fuzzy around the edges of the letters. And uh, also, at some point in the future, if there should be a need, you could display videos and other files as well. Um, this summer, the staff computer lease expires, and so we'll be replacing staff computers. And the legislature generally does a security assessment by a third party every one to two years. We did not do it last year during the pandemic, so we're planning to do that later this year. And we do a very comprehensive security assessment, penetration testing, vulnerability assessment of servers and workstations, um, social engineering, um, and then 
a year or two years ago, we also added a compliance review of the state security policy and legislative policies. And then uh, projects that have been completed, uh, the new printers were installed and ready for session. The exchange email system has been upgraded and uh, hopefully will be more stable and better performance going forward. And we've also upgraded the legislative firewalls to uh, give us 10 gig of bandwidth through the firewall. And I'll stand for questions. Senator Pittman. Thank you for those updates and thanks for the work to make our place Welcome. a better place to work with with the technology. Um, you know, I, I didn't realize how much I enjoyed the House voting system display boards <laughs> until I moved over into the Senate. And I got to tell you, it's really nice to have that visibility, as you can expect. Am I mistaken that the Senate president has a board that has the vote count on it, as well as the one that's inside the Senate majority leader and Senate president's back hallway there? There is a display there, right? There is, yes. I, I can't help but notice that. And there are walls up there that have plugs ready for a display, right? Um, actually, th there is power but no data to those locations. There's data on the other side of the walls in the offices. So it wouldn't be too hard to pull that data feed into a monitor that would showcase information that's only currently being shown to certain majority leader leadership positions? The technology um, exists to do that, yes. Okay, I just want to confirm that. And the second thing is, would it be hard to put more cameras inside of the Senate chamber? There's only one camera, and it sometimes doesn't pick up everybody inside of the, the chamber, I've noticed. When, uh, during Capitol Restoration, that was the first wing to be renovated, and uh, I think that a a lot of lessons were learned. So the conduit used in that wing is actually a quarter inch smaller than other data conduit throughout the rest of the building. And the Senate, uh, frankly, does not have enough data jacks. So to add more cameras, we're going to have to figure out a wiring path and bring more wire in. Okay. And so um, it will be kind of expensive, I think, to do that. So. $5 million like we had, or is it something a little less than that? Probably a little less. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. I think sure we're talking that. thousands. Okay, thanks so much. Yes. Does the Senate really need to be seen and heard? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've asked the same question many times about their boards, and I've, I've heard it's a Senate thing. You know, they don't, yeah, they don't want to. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering, you mentioned the, uh, the wiring uh, challenges. Uh, I mean, could it be done through Wi-Fi now, possibly? Or I know the security is a little bit different for that. But uh. Well, un unfortunately, in the chambers, we are also pushing the limits of the wireless network as well. In fact, in the House, uh, just because of the lack of data jacks, in the House, when they were doing the remote voting earlier, we actually put access points on top of desk, the representative's yeah, desk. I, I remember that. <laughs> right, and they're stuck everywhere. We've got them stuck underneath the media desk. Any place we could steal a data jack, we put a wireless AP. So I think uh, both chambers, you know, we might in the future want to look at the cabling or expanding the wireless Network All right, thank there. you. Mm -hmm. Representative Shu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just wondering about kind of general feedback that you guys have gotten about the laptop refresh. Um, I, I kind of like the touch screens from last year. That was kind of cool. Did, did legislators have issues with USB-C versus USB-A, stuff like that? Just general thoughts. Um, we, I think this year, everyone has been so busy with everything else going on and um, all the other changes we've put into place that we really haven't received much feedback at all. So I would welcome that, yes. And uh, other than the touch screen, people either seem to love it or hate it. And I have had a few people ask about that. Yeah, I miss the touch screen also, but I uh, understand. Yeah, Representative Collins. I'm sorry, Curtis. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Terry, for being here. Um, 
I know we're using a lot more technology. A lot more of us are on there, like security. And I, we're going to do a security assessment, so that'll be good to see how we've improved, perhaps. But um, have, have you any issues this year that um, any big concerns? Are we getting better? Well, Legislators not clicking on, on phishing. <laughs> um, we've actually implemented several new security tools over the last 18 months. And that has really helped us catch threats coming in through email um, or just users uh, on the internet. And so what, uh, one thing that we'll do as part of the security assessment this time is we'll take a look at the tools we've put in place and make sure that they're stacked up and protecting the areas that need to be protected. Yeah, that we're using those dollars most effectively and protecting the right things. Um, and I think, and we'll also have to have a big push on user training. All right, any other questions? Well, I'm excited about the new video boards. That'll, that'll be nice. We can show the final, you know, the March Madness games while we're sitting there on the, in the chamber, maybe one, one night or something, so. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Terry. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. I appreciate you making that effort. Let's give you a I just want to give everybody a, you know, a written report. Touch some of the high points, kind of like Terry did. Eric, can you get a little closer? I'm not sure it's. Like that? Is it on? Okay, I'll get up close and personal to it. All right, there we are. Okay. Well, as I was saying, I'm just give you some highlights of my written report. Um, as you see here, the first part, we. It was Kalis this year to process 769 bills that we introduced between both chambers. We need to change the number from 70 to, I think, 72 today after some work in the House. They more into, uh, resolutions. And then of all those bills, 118 of them um, became law. Um, going on then. We also, some work we did during session, right prior to and during we introduced a new general orders ordering interface for both the House and Senate that leadership uses to create your, order your general orders every day as well as produce your reports. Um, we've still got some kinks to work out with that that we're working with both, both chambers on right now. And as another part of the transparency work that we did with the, along with the video um, systems and everything, we deployed an early release testimony and miscellaneous document system to allow committee assistance committee staff the ability to upload testimony prior to the start of a meeting and then make that um, testimony documents available to the public as well as committee members at the start of session or just before it. So we're going to be working with staff, committee staff and others to try to improve that process because I know there's some growing pains early in the, in the year and for that and start of a session both and Senate adopted some new rules to uh, promote transparency in government. Um, we worked with both uh, the advisor's office and staff from both chambers to start implementing those earlier this year. That's kind of reporting requested by information and requested on behalf of information. We're going to be going into a second phase of that here over the interim. We'll add that information to the bills. that. Um, coming up over the interim, we're going to be working with the Senate to rework their um, journal processes, how they generate their journal, as well as some of the, how it appears even in the documents. We'll be working with Tori starting next week on that. Um, and we also are continuing to finish up our work on upgrading the text editor used in the Kalis thick clients that everyone uses both chambers as well as revisor and legislative research. We plan to actually start full-fledged testing of it, installing the system early next week. And 
get it out earlier during the winter and summer to the departments for those testing. Give us the rest of the summer and fall to fully test that. And if it passes all their testing, their acceptance testing, we'll go ahead and move that into production by the start of the 2022 session. And one of the more fun projects for our staff is we're going to start developing doing some design and analysis work on a member interface portal to allow legislative members the ability to have a secure interface to go log in to it, um, have like a dashboard view into Kalis, track some of their electronic bill books comes to mind and a few of the other things that I've mentioned here as far as like dynamic calendar and then like they can keep notes, confidential notes and community schedules and things on there. So I understand this will be a first version of it that will be coming out by next session, but you know, it'll be a ground floor place to start. So with that, I'm finished and stand for questions. All right. Thank you, Eric. Before we go to questions, I know that during the interim, there was some discussion in LCC about maybe doing a new RFP for Kalis, I believe. Um, where's that at? I'll probably let oh, okay. All right, Alan. If Yeah, we've we've been working with the uh, legislative divisions uh, developing that RFP, and uh, we'll be working with the LCC more to to forward that effort based on the decisions from the LCC. Okay, so that doesn't have any effect on the upgrades that you're that you're doing right now. Not right now. I mean, we have to continue to resolve issues that staff are having, and uh, look look at ways of updating the system to make to make the system provide information better for members and staff uh, as, as requested, so. All right, thanks, Alan. Senator Peterson. Um, yes, I don't know for sure, I'd have to check in on that. That's what we're we're going to try for. Yes, to get to get a system up and going for you. So, yep. And it may have limited functionality because we're going to try to hit some of the low hanging fruit of things that are easy for us to develop. But we do have to develop some infrastructure for that, like security and and sign in and things. So, we want to make sure it's very secure before we move into uh, some of the more heavy functions of the system. Senator Pittman. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Alan, again. Um, three things that would probably, if I think about this right off the cuff, what would make my job a little easier from a technology and application support piece. One is, if you are doing, and I love the idea of a member portal, I also love the idea of a CRM type solution, CRM being relationship management that helps track. Obviously, we've had a lot of unemployment calls coming in, you know that, uh, as well as a lot of other issues, and tracking those inside of a system provided you know, whether it's a real basic or just tracking some of that information over time uh, could be very helpful if it's user-friendly user enough that a staff member could use it as well as us. Something to think about uh, I'd like you to consider. Yeah, and the other thing is uh, when it comes to the type of bill, bill tracking, I think of one of the, the di more difficult things I do is track the budget and do some of the budget analysis. It's a little bit more of an ask of how that would actually work, but something around slicing and dicing and looking at versioning as we work through the budget process is actually something I think would be very helpful, but I can see that being a, a difficult thing to think through and design. But I think that something around that would actually make uh, my life better. And then the third thing I would say is um, when we think about information distribution, um, I think about you know active shooter, we think about uh, January 6th, things at the US Capitol, we think about text systems that could be automatic alerts that we as legislators could subscribe to that would have an emergency alerting system if there was like an active shooter in the, the, the building uh, that we need to be very aware of. Um, that as an application, I would find that very, very useful if that were going on. Um, and then an informational thing for me personally, if there's a, a vote going on, <laughs> a recorded vote, uh, that would be uh, very informational just to make sure that, you know, somebody could say, boom, there's an alert going on that, hey, this is out there, or even a CCR report is now available on your desks. Um, sometimes it's word of mouth, sometimes it's through caucuses, 
but having something where we can subscribe to that in each chamber would actually be uh, for me. I think that I think that would be you know very useful. So I just want to put that out there. Take take that into consideration. Thank you so much, Representative Shu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm also very interested in this member portal. So as much as like legislator input could come into that, that'd be great. Um, I serve as the policy chair for the the minority side. Um, and so I get asked a lot of questions. And then I've noticed, especially this year, um, in previous years, we were able to bill search by text. This year, we were not able to on the website. Um, is that going to come back, or, or can we bring that back? Yeah, it'll be, it'll be coming back, because I thought it was already still there. Or still there, so. Yeah, that made it much more difficult this year to, to not be able to, to find the bill that you're in need. Okay, definitely. That. Any other questions? All right, not seeing none. Thank you, Eric. Alan, thank you, and Terry and, and Eric, thank you for your work this year. And, and I know it was, uh, uh, it was challenging. Um, you know, that first week especially, uh, you guys um, took the challenge and, and got us up and going fairly quickly, and, and uh, um, we appreciate that. And I think that the, in, in all, it, it turned out very well. So appreciate that and look forward to uh, what the upgrades and future looks. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. All right. Up next, we have um, Kelly O'Brien with uh, the judici yeah, judicial branch. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, I'll, I'll try to keep you on time for sure. So um, I'm going to just update you briefly on our, our centralized case management project. Uh, for those who don't know or don't remember, we are replacing our, our state case management system. We're going from a distributed environment. In other words, every county has their own uh, case management system to a centralized system. Uh, we're using Tyler Technologies. Um, and and we, we, we have broken the project up into seven different tracks. There's actually eight now because Johnson County is part of it, but they're so new we really haven't dialed in the schedule yet. Um, but right now there's there's seven tracks. Six of those are district courts and one of those are appellate, uh, the appellate court. Um, we currently are installed in track one and track three. We did not do track two yet. Um, there was a reason for that. Uh, the, the reason originally was Sedgwick County was in, in track two. Um, they had some integrations that, that they were going to need to create from between the, the, the Odyssey, the, the court case management system, and their, their prosecutor system. And those just weren't going to be done in time. So we moved, um, uh, we, we originally moved track two after track three, but now we have since moved Sedgwick out of track two completely and moved them to the end to give them enough time to build, build that system locally. Um, so we are in track, again, in track one and track three, which are 23 uh, courts. Um, five of those are, are dual courthouse counties, so technically we're in 28 um, courts. We, on June 7th, we will go live in track two, um, which are, is um, uh, districts 13 and 18, El Dorado, uh, down, down in that neighborhood. In August, we will go live with uh, our first really large courts, um, that'll be track four, and I won't read each district, but inside of those is, is Shawnee and Kansas City or Wyandotte. Um, and then track five we'll, we'll, we'll bring up in February of 2022, and track six will come in June. The appellate will come between those two in, in uh, April of 2022. Um, uh, like everybody else, the pandemic threw a little bit of a wrench in, in what we wanted to do with this. Um, it, it was, it, you know, we had to pause for a number of months, um, uh, but, but we are getting, getting our feet back under us. Um, one of the things that, that we have spent the pause in, uh, working on during the pause is that we, we did have the two tracks up to 20 plus courts. We did find there were some, some gaps in, in, in the software that need to be identified and fixed. And, and so we, we have spent that time working with our vendor to close those holes. Um, and, and we're there, and, and that's why we're going to go start our, start our rollouts again here in June and stay on a pretty steady cadence from, from now until, until we, we finish this. Um, 
part of the things, um, I'll just kind of go over some of the things that each court has to go through because some of you may hear um, from, from your constituents. It, it, this is a big project and, and it requires a lot of work from, from the local courts um, and, and staff. And, and, you know, we, we have to convert all the old data. So, so nobody knows their data better than, than that local court, right? So they have to spend time converting that. But at the same time, they need to try to do their daily job. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a big lift for them to, to try to uh, get all the work done and be prepared for these go lives. We, we have offered, you know, what we call work share clerks from different parts of the state. Uh, to, to help remotely, you know, work the refiling queues. Uh, we can route phones. We can do, do other things to try to take some of that, that away, some of that, that daily work away from them. But uh, again, it's just a big lift. And, and it's one thing that we have found that, that everywhere we go, that, that's a conversation we have. And, and we will till the end. I mean, it's just, there, again, there's, there's really no way around it. And, and so, um, with that, you know, uh, we talked about the, the conversion. They got to map their codes. They got to do some other things. So, but but we are continuing to work march through this. Uh, I feel good where we're at. I feel good where the software is at. Um, I, I'm I'm feeling good with the communication with all the district courts that they know uh, what's coming and what what's in front of them, and um, we, we just need to keep keep pace and and, and move forward. Uh, one of the big benefits from this, um, we talked a lot about obviously the benefit to the court is uh, centralized. I think that's pretty clear what the benefit to me and, and to the Supreme Court is, is you know, we have statewide data available at our fingertips. Um, but but from, the, from our customer point of view, um, what, what we're building as far as through public access, uh, the ability to have access to to data that they should have access to, right? I mean, anything sealed or confidential or, or you know, that involves kids or whatever, that, that won't be made available unless they're a party to it. Um, but y your neighbors or my neighbors just have access to general public information, but they will have access to the document now, which they don't currently have, unless they go to the courthouse. So the, they'll be able to sit at home and have access to that. Um, and, and then, of course, our elevated users um, will have access to anything. They'll have access to all of that plus anything else that they're uh, a party to or should have access to. So we, we believe um, the, the ability um, to access the information will be a huge benefit for, for all the customers of, uh, of the court system. And then, of course, we have, we have connections, right? We have to send information to different, different agencies and departments around the state, KBI, DMV, and those type of things. Um, and we've, we, we've gotten that working pretty smoothly and, and working out. But when, as Joe Mandela from the KB and I were just talking outside, after we, we get this all settled in and installed, there's going to be a lot of other things that we can start looking into to, to uh, uh, automate, whether that's warrants and things like that, you know, standardize that across, across the state, make sure that we're providing those in a safe, secure way. To, to the people that need access to that, of course, to, the, to, to law enforcement and, and whoever. And, you know, of course, the judge doesn't have to, uh, uh, just has to roll over, hopefully, in bed at 2 in the morning and sign instead of having to get up and answer the door with the deputy sheriff or, or go down to the courthouse or whatever it may be. So um, I know I went over a few things pretty quick, but I am trying to get you out of here. So if you have any questions, I'm, I'm here, here to answer. All right, thank you, Kelly. You know, one of the, when I remember the very beginning of this e or e uh, court mm -hmm. um, was to make, make it so that court clerks could work in different yes. areas. And I know you only have a couple of them going, but is that working? Have you even started that yet? Or? Yeah, I, I mean, we have. Um, every court that we, obviously, we have standardized all our processes, right? So it's no longer that you initiate a case one, Allen initiates a case one way and, and Senator Peterson initiates a case another way. That, that's not going to happen. Everybody does that the same. Everybody takes their payments the same. Everybody schedules things the same. So yes, uh, that, that is in place and can be used. Um, uh, for people to, uh, to do that. It, not only that, 
for, for our customers of the court, right? It's important for them to have the same experience whether they're out in Garden City or, or whether they're, they're in Topeka uh, going over to Shawnee County. We, we want our customers, attorneys in, in particular, we, we, you know, the, uh, there were differing rules uh, as far unwritten rules probably actually on how an attorney interacted with a court, which w was, if you are dealing with courts, especially side by side, um, uh, that was very frustrating, right? They, they didn't like the idea that, that this court over here would reject the filing because it wasn't in all caps, whereas the, the court next door accepted it and didn't care about that. So, so yes, long way to answer your question. We standardized all that. We've seen the benefit locally or seen the benefit as a court system. But I also think we're going to see the benefit for our customers around, around the state as well. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, right. Kelly. Thank you. Appreciate it. You guys have a good afternoon. Uh -huh. All right. So, Madam Secretary, I think we're going to, we're going to flip it, right? We're going to do the dashboard first. Is, is that correct? We are, if that's okay. okay, sir. All right, so Travis uh, Trail is going to uh, uh, give us a presentation on the dashboard. Is that right? He yeah. is, and so right. he is. Um, well, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the quarterly reports um, and then do the dashboard, or are you guys ready to do the dashboard? Well, it, whichever you want to do. That's I think uh, we want to make sure that there, <laughs> technology, we want to make sure that we're able, because we're going to try to do a live demo of the dashboard so you guys can actually see it, because we keep talking about it, so... I need to make sure with the team, are we? Okay, so if you all don't mind, we'll walk through the quarter, quarterly reports first, and then he'll do the demo of the dashboard, and then I will come back and round out with a few high-level updates and then can take any series of questions. Okay, yeah, that'll work, thank all you. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Travis Rail. If you all remember, you met Travis uh, uh, kind of at the end of last year. He joined us as our Chief Information Technology, our Chief Information Technology Architect. There's lots of letters in our <laughs> in our titles, um, but he has been very active. And um, when we are kind of fully staffed with this role, the IT reporting, the keto process actually falls under him. So going forward, I'd like for him to be able to present to you. He's touching base and working directly with the agencies on a regular basis, knows where the projects are. And so he has uh, the best sense of where we are on that IT reporting. So he is gonna walk you through both the quarter four from uh, 2020 and then quarter one for 2021, both projects. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Alan, is it possible to get the presentation up on the screens here? Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and get started through the hard copies that you have. As the Secretary mentioned, today we'll be looking at the fourth quarter of, and I'm going to go through my hard copy, so I have that. The fourth quarter of 2020, which included October through December, the first quarter. The first quarter of January, March, uh, January through March. So, so looking at okay. Oh, excellent, excellent. It's like I've never used technology before or something. <laughs> All right, so in that first quarter, we had 10 planned reports, sorry, 10 planned projects, 14 approved projects, 22 active projects, and five projects were completed during the fourth quarter of 2020. Uh, in those active projects, 19 were from the executive branch, two from the region institutions, one legislative branch project, and there were no judicial branch. Those active projects broke down into, there were nine projects in good standing, five uh, infrastructure projects in good standing, three in caution, one in alert, and three were recast. And I think the one is, there was one on hold. So projects in caution during the fourth quarter of 2020 included the KDHE Bureau of Environment, uh, Bureau of Environmental Remediation Database, the KDHE uh, Bureau of Water, Bureau of Water EPA e-reporting system, and the OITS NEP 
waste land use advisory information. Projects and alert status, the DCF Kansas Prevention and Protection Services, PPS, and the Comprehensive Child Welfare Information System, CCWIS, and the planning project. And new projects approved during that time were the OITS Microsoft licensing upgrade to include end user mobility, security suite project, and the KDOT enhanced priority formula system, and the uh, KUMC research administration and education Huron research suite project. That concludes the fourth quarter of 2020. Any questions? Yeah, could you go over? I'm, I'm just looking at the, I like DCF, and it's an alert. Can you go over why, why it's why it's an alert? I, I do have a brief update, and the this agency CIO is also here and could answer any detailed questions you have. Um, this uh, this project that was alert in the fourth quarter is not in alert now. It was remediated in the next quarter. Almost all the projects we're going to talk about were due to delays as a result of the efforts of the last year. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, but if you do want some more details, I can get those for you or have that CIO come over. Well, I guess. I guess we'll just see what the first quarter looks like, and, <laughs> and then maybe we might have some more. Unless anybody else has this, is that all right? Okay. Um, on this particular report, it was 33% behind on deliverables, but mostly due to delays in the planning of those. It's like my first time in here or something. <laughs> just, just a little bit, just a little bit. It's my rookie season, so we'll see how I get through it. We're pretty easy on <laughs> It's the last day, right? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on the fourth quarter? Of, uh, okay. The first quarter, January, March of 20, 2021 of this year, there were five planned uh, IT projects, 19 approved, 22 active, and seven were completed during that quarter. Active projects included 18 in the executive branch, three in region institution, in the region institutions, one in the legislative branch. Active projects breakdown included, there were eight projects in good standing, four infrastructure projects in good standing, one in caution, five in alert, three in recast, and one on hold. Projects in caution included the KDOT construction management system, CMS replacement implementation effort. And the projects and alert status included the KDHE DER remediation data management system, the KDHE BOW EPA e reporting project, the OITS voice end user device refresh project, the KDA, uh, sorry, KBI DNA data bank software replacement, and the Kansas virtual playhouse. New projects approved in that quarter included the Department of Administration SSIF claims data management system, KDADS hospital HER sudden implementation. OITS ServiceNow CMDB Discovery Integration Hub Project, the KDOL IT Modernization Project, and the KU Canvas Learning Management System, KU Data Center, and Hardware Network Refresh Project. Any questions around those projects? Well, again, I think if, if you could kind of go over the... So the project in caution status was KDOT one was 12% over schedule. So for, uh, and this might be a refresher, but uh, caution status are any projects that go 10% over their budgeted time or, or, or dollar amount, 20% for those in alert status. This project was 13% over. The project needed additional time to perform setup of some of the new functionality. The window for, fu for implementation of this new application can only occur in the spring and late fall construction season is over, which limits the deployment window. The delay will not impact overall budget, but will allow the team to continue refining these processes in order to have a smoother transition to next year. Scroll back to it. The first one on there, the KDHE remediation data management system. Uh, that project was uh, plans to complete this month. It was 20, at, the, at the time of the reporting, it was 26% behind on its deliverable completion. The KDHE Bureau of Water EPA Bureau of Water EPA reporting system plans to complete in September of 2021. That project is in alert for being right at 20% behind on deliverable completions. The OITS voice end user device refresh. Uh, 
that project was initially uh, involved in the distribution of new phones to state to, uh, state entities, and that project was uh, started prior to uh, COVID-19 last year, and then as employees went home and took phones home, we had to delay that project as the employees returned and went home. The KBI DNA databank software replacement, um, that project began actually in January of 21 with the development of an interface, an MPIC interface with KBIT IT, but was delayed due to commitments and higher priorities within KBI. Um, a change order will be processed when an, a revised approach has been approved by the agency. Um, the project is in alert status due to being 31% behind. Heard about the virtual state house. Any questions on the project's in alert status? So the, the Bureau of Error, or are both of those in the Bureau of Error are just the, the Bureau of Environment. Well, I guess one of them is Bureau of Environment, one of them is Bureau of Water. They've been in alert status now for a couple of quarters. Do we... Sorry, go ahead. No, that's all right. Go ahead. So... They were in caution status the previous quarter and then in alert status this quarter, first quarter. Okay, I thought they were in alert, both of them, but okay. In the fourth quarter of 2020, it was just a uh, DCF project. That was, it is no longer in alert status. So... What is your feel on those two as far as getting back on track? What, what's their remedy? So, you know, as what's gone on in the last year and speaking with their CIO recently, um, they're, they're getting ready to turn back and focus on that. You know, a lot of their effort over the last 12 months has been... They just had to take all the, take resources off of those projects, and now as that starts to slow down, they're able to rebound and get focused on that. Okay, all right. Any other questions? Yep, Senator Peterson. Go back that KDOT uh, CMS system. Are we expecting it to go into alert <coughs> status because there's a limited time frame of work on that? I don't want to speculate about where they're going to be at on it. I haven't spoken with their CIO specifically about this, but I can find out. That's fine. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Now we're going to try a live demo, which always goes really well. Um, so I wanted to do a demo for the Keto Project Dashboard. This is an initiative that we launched back in February, um, and we went live with back in February, and the intent was to provide, one, more transparency in the approval and reporting process these, as well as um, providing more real-time information on where these projects are at in flight. Like we just had this meeting and we talked about stuff in December and stuff in January and so this uh, this project so I'm going to find the, the keto website. So the idea here is that this staff is also updating this in, in near real time as we receive new about projects were up in accordance with what we're receiving. So the project dashboard here, and I know some of you have seen it um, on our website. There's a link at the top in our menu. We group those projects into those planned, approved, and active project statuses, as well as showing each each line here. So we're looking at the planned. Our currently planned projects includes the name of the project, the department that's uh, that's interested in conducting the project, if it's active, what that active status is current project cost, its page number as it appears in the quarterly report, and then um, that is actually also a link into the quarterly report, and then we also, for some of the newer projects, have links to documents that are going to be publicly available, such as the high-level plan and the detailed plan. For these, so you can see our plan projects, um, approved projects and approved status. If we get down here, we can start to see those active projects, right? So here's that active status, what's in gotten a lot of feedback from just even from agency CIOs that have found this very helpful to see what's happening in the project, what's going on in the, in the reporting process and keeping up with project management happening. Senator Peterson. So if I'm on there, right? 
If I'm on the dashboard and I want to look at the keto report, I can just go over and click on the page number and it would link right to the detailed report. That's right. I'll, I'll choose this Fort Hayes State one on page 50. It's going to open up this P, that PDF. That's fantastic. Right <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, any other questions? I, I, there's not much. So one thing, as you all know, we've talked about this, and over the last year, really trying to find out there's so much material, as you all know, and as the stuff moves through, you know, you get copied on things and the emails, but when you need it, you can't always get back to it. So this is our first attempt at pulling some of this information together. One of the things that Travis will be doing is, again, reaching out, making sure you all know how to navigate it, but also we will continue to get feedback because if there's other layers we can put in there or different pieces of information. Um, and eventually, you know, this is all of the public information. As we talk and I've talked with uh, you know, Chair Hoffman about just that more, um, you know, you, you all's ability to know what's moving when and where those documents are. You know, you could see this is all public, but there could be a next level where there was more of a secure login. And as you guys start to work on as Alan was talking about, like, you know, that your internal portal where you could get to another level of documents uh, for that would be appropriate for JCIT um, that we may not link completely on the public website. So you know, just try. We're 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 starting, um, and no, this is our attempt that we did hear you around trying to find the information better so that it is at your disposal. And so we continue to need that partnership and feedback to refine this, but to also uh, continue to build out other tools or resources like this to allow you all to get to the information you need in a more timely way. Senator Pittman. Thanks for this. Uh, you know, I was impressed when you first took me through it and I'm still impressed, uh, obviously, linking through this thing is a great thing. Looking forward into the vision of where you're going with this, if I think about things that are important to me on this committee, I think about um, some of the questions that we've heard today. Some of the kinds of questions are, where were we at uh, last quarter versus this quarter? Thinking about metrics as we move through, even on a quarterly basis, of projects that are moving along. So that's something to be thinking about is graphically. How do we look at uh, grouping totals of inside of these nice attributed characteristics you have to give graphics, um, whether they're clickable or not? You know, Maybe that's something in the future. But that kind of graphic that moves us through, and then as we tie into it, dollarizing some of these things and adding the risk component to it and the number of FTEs and one day maybe in the performance-based metric measure. I mean, that's, that's way off, I know, maybe six months. Um, but um, that, that, that kind of information is going to be uh, some key pieces, I think. My, my question would be, how hard is this to update? Let's say that you weren't doing this and you had staff members kind of pulling this information, is it a self-serving portal where each of the agencies can upload a standardized document of some sort, or is it something that's uh, pretty manual right now, and what's your vision there? Uh, right now it is a manual process. We're still, the, the keto process is in itself a very manual email spreadsheet-driven process. So what my staff does is from the quarterly reports you get, well, they reconcile with us the quarterly reports to make sure it matches. As new projects come in, emails, which is mostly how we receive those today, they go in and update them. So it's a very manual process. Our vision is an automated process, a software vision, where agencies can go in and provide this information through an, through an automated workflow so that that will speed up both the reporting and the approval process. When we think about that, one of the propositions I know the chair of this committee has offered is maybe getting into a more re regular meeting process um, that we'd be more engaged with some of these projects as they go through approval process. And then, you know, concurrent with that, we, we're talking about a risk-based assessment model that should be automated as well, one would hope. Um, this seems to be key to anything that if we were to start moving along those lines, instead of us slowing that process down, I think something like this that would facilitate that type of meeting, give more update informa updated information, show relative risk in a, in a monthly cadence be predicated on you know having that as more of an automated process on their side so it seems like if we were to move forward with that idea this seems like it should follow along nicely with it and that would be something that I think we'd be looking for to 
go down that path. So I'm pretty excited about it. And I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, my, my hope is through this year to try to refine that legislation on the risk base and the NS meeting more often, maybe, I guess, look at it more as a robust committee. I mean, I'm looking at, looking at this, there's almost a hundred million dollars worth of IT projects that we are seeing basically almost for the first time that have already been reapproved. And so I, I think that's where our, our problem is in the whole system is that, you know, they're, they've already been approved. Now I know one of them is pretty good size. It's, um, you know, KDAL, but still, you know, I think as we move along, we, we need to have that ability to see these projects quicker. So before they're, um, before they're approved, you know, for an RFP. So any other questions? All right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. You did a great job. Well, you did okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, we have a great staff, and um, as um, our new CETA, he has been working really hard to understand the process and think about how we engage with stakeholders, you all, the agencies, our vendor partners, and so um, please know that you'll see more of him and have more of conversations, and you know, as you have, you know, ideas, you know, Senator Pittman, others, you know, please share them because we're trying to improve these processes and also get you all the information that is relevant to the roles that you have and the work that we do. So I'm going to take you through just a couple of updates. Um, first and foremost, um, Sorry, I was looking to see who was behind me. Our team, because we're in a smaller room, is all over in a conference room watching you all. And so I had to see who had walked into the room uh, as I started to, to talk. Um, a couple of uh, staffing updates. Uh, many of you uh, engaged with or met or heard uh, from our CTO and uh, Deputy Stacy Mill, and she was very... Um, very key and critical in a lot of the work that we have done since I stepped into this role. Um, Stacy actually left us in April uh, to go back home. Um, she is from the uh, Kentucky area and has family there. And I think all of us over this last year, you know, have looked around and made all kind of choices about going forward. And uh, we were uh, very sad to see her go, excited for her to be able to move back closer to family and um, and have a good opportunity and just appreciative of the work that she has championed and moved along. She was the driving force behind um, where we are in our uh, data center migration, along with a number of other initiatives that we continue to bring you. We did, we have posted that position. It closes one day next week, I think June 3rd, uh, and uh, we'll move forward with those interviews and those candidates. I can tell you uh, over the last few months, the roles that we have posted um, at varying levels that we are getting robust applicant pools um, and from, um, you know, all over. Uh, and I will say that uh, many of us during this virtual time, myself included, have been fairly active regionally and nationally speaking on panels, um, writing, you know, just short stories about the work that's happening in Kansas, because um, I really want to uh, make sure the narrative of the strong work that is happening here is getting out there. Um, we're not broken. We are improving and we're growing um, and we have a great team. So um, I think that message is being heard and that we are seeing more and more um, in a, a strong applicant pool. So um, more to come there. Uh, but just so you know, it is currently open, uh, closes on June 3rd, and then we will be reviewing those applicants. Additionally, one other change that has happened since I was with you all last. Yes, I think both have happened. So uh, our formerly uh, the CIO for KHP is Kelly Johnson. Um, over the time of uh, dealing with some of the challenges in uh, the Department of Labor, uh, I did a temporary move and shifted resources within the state. So we took 
Kelly from labor and put him in as an interim over a KDAL. I took resources out of the KESO's office and other agencies and, and shifted them into KDAL to give some additional support uh, beyond what was already there. Um, and over time, we have found that that was actually an amazing fit for Kelly. And so I uh, named Kelly as the CIO for KDAL in January, I believe, which then opened up the CIO for KHP. Where's Kel Kelly is here. Is Jamie here? Jamie's not. So uh, subsequently, then we did a national search and um, we were fortunate that Jamie Holly joined us as the CIO for KHP. Jamie comes to us most recently from the Marine Corps IT Center. He has over 22 years of IT project management and cybersecurity experience, and most of his experience has been in military. We had a very robust pool uh, for that CIO position, had three really strong top candidates, and Jamie was the best fit. He has been on the ground for about four weeks um, and is in there already sending me lists of things and resources that he needs and work that he is excited to do in that space. So just sharing that, some of the names have shifted, things of that nature. Um, we'll get you an updated list of the agency CIOs. I know some of you reach out to them directly for issues and wanting to make sure you know where all the staffing is and um, what's going on in those spaces. All right, policy updates. Just so you know, um, we continue to work on updating and keeping policies moving and working uh, through ITEC. Um, as was just talked about, the 200 series is where the IT reporting, the risk management, all of that is. We are still working that. Or we'll be working with you over the next few months, as the chair has already mentioned, and continue to refine that work. Additionally, I think it really speaks to something that Senator Pittman was hinting at. As we start to do this, it's not just about the technology, but it is also about the processes and making sure we're thinking about how information is moving to and through, and then leveraging the technology for us to be able to access that. And so as we are looking at that, that 2000 series, we're continuing to think about that and work through with smaller working groups um, how to operationalize some of these pieces. What does that look like? What does the impact look like? What types of tools like automated tools, project management tools that feeds data from an agency in and through, how do we leverage those things? So continuing to work on that 2000 series, you will hear more from us uh, undoubtedly as you all meet throughout the summer and fall. For the 5000 series, which includes uh, business contingency planning and business contingency implementation, um, we kicked off uh, a, I believe we kicked it off in November or December. So I think I mentioned to you that that working group was just starting the last time we were together. Uh, they have gone through multiple drafts, uh, presented their drafts at ITAP, presented their first draft at ITEC. They are still working on their final draft and it should be before ITEC in uh, probably the September meeting um, for a vote. Uh, the 8,000 series, which is data administration program, um, similarly kicked off around the November, December timeframe. Um, I have uh, submitted drafts through ITAB and ITEC, and they are actually ready to present their final draft to ITEC at the upcoming June meeting. So again, we're continuing to um, you know, update policies. Uh, one of the reasons that the 5000 series is a little bit more delayed is because we sent them back to the table to make sure, because it has a lot of the coup planning and um, recovery items in that particular series of policies to make sure that there were things that we learned over the last year around remote work and hybrid working that were also incorporated into that policy a little bit stronger. So they went back and they're doing a little bit more work. Otherwise, they probably would have been ready for June. All right. Data center migration. It's data center. Um, so where we are, we have migrated a little over 1,300 servers in, since August. Um, and we really are at, I don't even know if it's a 98% mark. I think it's higher, but I you know, didn't want to make the number too high. We literally are at the point now where we have less than 30 servers that we are moving. Like we are at the end. But if anyone has ever done a home renovation project or anything of that nature, you know that last 0.5% is tough, 
right? So that's where we are. We're in a good place. Um, you can see corrections, labor, revenue, all still have service there. Again, total across all three, we're talking less than 30 um, that are left. There uh, were delays in many ways over these last few months. Um, some of them are actually on our partner vendor side, Unisys, and we're working with them to make sure that those get resolved and that um, you know, our contracts are adjusted accordingly as we move to and through this um, because there's implications for that time delay. Um, also, sensitivity to blackout windows. And so we revenue has always had a particular window around you know, active tax season and that we can't move so many weeks before it, so many weeks after. And so with some of the delays that happened with the vendor, we ended up sliding into their blackout season. So we missed a partial window, not at revenues fall, more so of just overall the project slipping just a bit. So we cannot touch that final system, and it is one of their main tax systems until they are completely done, which, you know, it just ended. We, they need so many weeks, and so right now we're projecting we'll finish up corrections, which is expected in the next week or so. Labor has a handful more uh, that will go, which is their last few. And then the last, the very last set that we will move will be uh, revenue. The OITS, we are, as you can imagine, we're part of the foundation and, and hardware. So it's once everybody is out, then we move out. The other thing that's occurring across the month of June is when you do something like that, there is some hardware that we have to decommission and clean and surplus and all of that. So we are physically, while these are the only um, actual migrations that are left, we still have a number of agencies where we're like, you know, moving cages, the physical servers, decommissioning, things of that nature. So we're still, there's still a, a, a bit of movement, but right now we're looking at hopeful that by the end of July, we should be in, out, and through, and uh, in the month of August, able from an OITS standpoint to turn that space over to my other hat, the Department of Administration, so that we can renovate that space and turn that into a uh, viable office space that uh, is needed. One more update and then I will uh, open up to questions for things that I reported or other questions you might have. And this is the OIT service rates. If you remember from the very first time I stood in front of you, these service rates we know are um, an area that has been a longstanding challenge uh, with uh, the agency. And so we committed to understanding them, smoothing them, doing better. We did better this year. We're still learning, tweaking, and we believe for 2022 and 23 that we're getting even better. And so as of right now, uh, and we have to submit our rates, I think, like, Tuesday, so we're right, uh, we're pretty much done. But we are, it looks like we will be able to keep all of the rates steady. Uh, what was published for FY22, as we go into it, there will be no increases, and most of those actually are almost flat from 21 to 22, actually. We kept them fairly consistent. Um, but there is one that actually will be reduced, and so the network and telecom rate will actually be coming down for FY22, um, and all other rates will be staying constant. Um, and then for 23, uh, we again continue to simplify the rates, understand them, make sure we're matching them on. If you remember, we were at like 118 rates and we took it down. We're at around 29. By FY23, we believe we'll be at 15 very clean rates. But we're also doing other things that are on the periphery. We have some agencies that their total bill to OITS is, let's say, um, $6,000 for the whole year, right? And it could be a, a smaller non-cabinet agency. Um, the way our billing happens right now, like they're literally billed every month, you know, so they get a $15 bill or a $100 bill. We're looking at ways to be able to offer to them where they can do like, here's your bill, it's 6,000. And if you wanna pay it just one time at the beginning of the year, if you wanna pay it quarterly, because I know some of them have revenue flows, but so that we also are thinking about how do we do this more efficiently and that we're not, you know, that billing every month takes time on our side, time on their side. And they're, they're for many of those that have those smaller bills, they're fairly consistent. There's not a, a variation. Larger uh, cabinet agencies, you know, that's very different because of utilization and other things that come into play. So, but there is a percentage of agencies that we're looking at to see how do we also streamline their billing process, right? So 
while we're looking at rates, we're also looking at process. Our goal is once the rates are published, because we got to go finish the process with the division of budget, but uh, later uh, this summer and the fall, um, we'll share with you what we do is like we can show what FY21 was by every single agency and then show you a comparison of the projected FY22 and 23, and you'll even be able to see some of the savings and things of that nature. So we'll, you know, just kind of to give you a snapshot of the impact that this has had. So just bringing this back because we do believe that this is also as important as our data center and, you know, those pieces that are the technical pieces, our operations have also impacted this agency over the years uh, that have um, put it at a disadvantage. So no, wanting you to know that we're still doing the work in this space that is impacting not only the center, but all of the agencies accordingly. I believe that is the end of my prepared remarks. I can take questions on anything that I presented or if there are other areas you all would like me to give an update on. Okay, on, on the rate comparisons, are, will you have that available for next meeting? Uh, as long as the, do we think we'll be meeting probably in July or June? Um, it probably, I won't have them available probably, probably until July. after the 1st of July because we have to finish the rate process with the division of budget. Once they publish those rates, I can share then the, co the comparison with you all of every. Yeah, it'll probably be July. Yep. So. so we should have them. Okay, great. Any other questions? Yep. Senator Pittman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, of course, uh, D'Angelo. Always a pleasure, and, I, and I'm always so impressed with the work you've done over the last couple of years in terms of bringing this office and uh, standardizing and bringing the information to the floor. Uh, on that note, one of the projects I think you were working on was kind of a survey of our, our hardware across the agencies um, and also an accounting of how many different types of software applications and, and things like that to give better visibility. Can you just kind of update us on status of that and then I have one other question that's not related so yes we um, I would say finished that project but it's never really finished uh, we did uh, get the inventory uh, delivered to us with also identifying some gaps that weren't captured in the inventory that we needed to follow up on uh, as that report and we used our third party that worked with us on that Travis, uh, our CETA, was just coming into his role. So we actually have now moved that into his area. And what we're looking at more long term is, again, software automation to be able, because that's some of that is really about like asset management tracking and to be able to say um, what's where, uh, what what is the status of it in terms of is it um, a legacy system, is it modernized, um, how many of what do we have? Um, and being able to connect that more broadly to our three-year plans, right? So if we're talking about what our priorities are for the next year, understanding where we are in terms of our hardware, software applications and where we're going is going to be key and critical. So we're using it kind of in two ways, more operationally from really getting to a place of um, asset management and being able to understand it, also using it for assessment um, as we're doing some things with cybersecurity, assessment of what type of cybersecurity needs do we need that are not piecemeal, but that can that need to be able to cover overarching. How do we think about what we have that might right now bolt on with one or three agencies, and is that something we need to elevate to the next level? So we're trying to analyze it and do some operationalizing of it. But then we're also using it as we begin to talk more strategy level. So we've been working on strategic framework for executive branch IT, but then we're also working on what is three to five. And with Travis being in the architecture role, we're starting to work on what's five to 10 look like and what decisions do we need to make in three to five to be ready for five to 10? What decisions based on that, um, that information do we need to address to even be ready for the three to five? And it goes back to understanding what is in that asset management. So um, I commit that you know either this summer or this fall, we can bring some of that back to you all so that you can see a little bit of how we're using that. But that is how I would talk about the two ways that we're using that information that we collect. The second question is kind of unrelated with, um, with local governments and county governments. Mm -hmm. um, can you just describe, you know, you've got a broad ranging, ranging role in technology and the interface with those organizations sometimes is there. 
do you have any insight? Can you give me, at least myself and maybe some other members of the committee, what is that like for the state at this point? Um, and and I, I could focus on the ransomware attacks that are on the counties, and we could focus on the security, we could focus on data, and we could talk about rates, um, we could talk about is there interaction. I mean, just in general, could you give me just a, a litmus test on what that's like right now, and is there something that we ought to be thinking about or, or the locals or the state should be thinking about? So I would say um, it's not where we would like for it to be. Um, I, I would say overall my assessment is that we have good relationships. So it's not a bad relationship. It's not that we don't work together, but it's not coordinated. It's not intentional. It can be very reactive. Something is going on. We have resources or there's a connection that's made. Um, an agency might be working in a particular area that then pulls in, you know, relationships across different types of entities in the, at that local level, um, but not in a way that is coordinated, strategic, um, consistent uh, at all is what I would say. We have pockets where I think we do it better and there are um, pieces within government that do it better because of the nature of how they do their work or, um, you know, health is one of those areas, right? So there's a lot more connectivity in that pathway, but not overall. So that's kind of that first piece of it's not bad, but it's not great and it's not really by design. Um, but there's interest, you know, you will see clusters of IT professionals at the local level connecting and working with us at the state level, again, kind of piecemeal. So some of the work that we have been thinking about is how do we do this better? And I will tell you where we're starting or the lens that we're starting is actually through a cybersecurity lens because it's the easiest for us to kind of get our, our minds around. Um, I've even tossed around the idea uh, with my key, so as he knows, because I said, right? this up as to how this might look. Like if we were to have someone sitting in that office that actually came you know, out of one of the county cities, the municipalities that then came to the state to help us think about how do we bridge that relationship? How do we leverage some of these resources? Because particularly when you start to talk cybersecurity, as a state, it's not about state government or local government. It's not even about public and private. Like when a state gets hit in a certain way, it can go in so many different directions. Um, and so we have a few things that we're hoping to launch in the next few months around this to um, facilitate some of that conversation, at least in the cybersecurity space between state and local, but also public and private. Uh, health, education, and bringing various groups and sectors that are thinking about this in Kansas together around what do we need to have in place that's kind of the higher level from a policy standpoint, um, operational, strategic at various levels across various pieces. How do we need to think about workforce development in this space as a state to really have the resources in state to, to be able to support who we are um, and what's coming and how we prepare ourselves, right? Um, so many, how do we think about um, incident response and disaster recovery, not as individual entities, but as collective groups that could leverage and support each other and actually be the backup or support if one gets hit, how are others already in play to be able to support, to help a larger network, right? So not just individual entities coming to the table. So we're starting some of that, not where we want to be. Where we're starting is in that cybersecurity place, but as you just mentioned, it's not the only one. So welcome, you know, and, and as I said, we have a couple things that we're hoping to roll out. And um, I hope that by the time we're all back together that some of that will be rolled out and I can talk a little bit more about and show you more concretely because we're still putting some pieces of that together. Um, but would welcome a broader conversation or ideas and into how we do this in a more intentional way and leverage our resources at the state to support across the state in various levels and various sectors. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the five to 10 year plan. Does, does that, when you look at a five to 10 year plan, are you looking as far into even like what we're running into with the with the uh, Senate 
where the conduit was that was put in was too small. Are you, are you go that far or are you just looking at more of the systems? Not quite. When we talk five to 10 year, I guess I would think of it as when we really are talking that or maybe more like seven to 10, we're going to be talking really up here in terms of a roadmap, right? Um, part of my background, as some of you know, is in higher education. And if you've ever worked with a higher education institution, they all have a space master plan, right? And it, it goes out like 15 years about all the potential spaces that they could potentially use at any given time that's open land and how it can be used. But it doesn't do like this building goes here and this building goes here because that's where the strategic plan that's more five to seven does. So I'm trying to get us to kind of stack this, right? To be thinking about in seven to 10, like what does the state need to look like at a very high level? And then as we do those three-year plans, that's where some of um, kind of that might that level is, but it's driven by if we want um, our environments to look a certain way. As we start to do any new uh, upgrades, we must ensure that the systems or uh, you know the wiring is. I'll give you an example. Cloud is a good example. Not to say that we're like running there, but to upgrade any system or any operation and not think about, is it cloud ready? Doesn't mean you have to take it to the cloud, but to update something, it's almost like you get a piece of hardware and when you install it, it's already you know out of support or will be out of support in 12 months. We gotta get out of that. And we unfortunately have done that a lot, right? It's like, it's right now, we need it, we have it, we'll plug it in. Well, let's not say what's right now, but what's the next thing? And maybe we are stepping over something and investing a little bit more so that we don't have to do it twice. But to be able to make those decisions, we have to start from an architectural standpoint, talk about what we would look like and what are all the spaces might be in a seven to 10 year. And then as you think about three to five and five to seven, what are the things we have to do today to correct things? And then in that, that you know, five to seven, what are the conversations we need to start having um, to move those operations? But as we are modernizing systems, for example, right? As we look at the, those pieces, you're almost, um, you never know what's gonna happen in IT because so many things can change, but there are some things that you can look at when you put systems together to make sure they're more open, um, that they are able to be more adaptable, that they are scalable. And those types of tenants that from an architecture standpoint, can we can say to an agency, as you start down the road to do X, Y, and Z, you need to make sure you're addressing these 10 things in this way. Now, how they do it in each project could be completely different, but that's where we're trying to get to of that, you know, that thinking about scalability, thinking about that openness, those so that we can point to and say, this is the direction that we've gone in. And, and there was, uh, we can demonstrate that these uh, discussions happen and it was part of the consideration and we don't have a crystal ball, but these things set us up for, for more, to be more agile uh, in an IT space. Does that help? Yes, it does. Yeah, appreciate that. And th then I had a question about the, um, the, old, the old hardware, I guess. You said you, you, know, you probably already started cleaning that out. You're going to continue. Is most of that just e-waste are you know recyclable now or is there any any of it that you are going to be selling or what's the what's the protocol on that so i'm going to look at my team i think it's a little bit of all there are a couple things that we're actually um what's the word reusing or repurposing <laughs> there's a word for that we're repurposing because you know, with uh, with our move to Eunice, is there some things that we need to back up differently or some other things that may have shifted? And we do still have, as you all remember, an on-prem data center in Eisenhower, much, much smaller footprint. So there are some things that we are repurposing. There will be some things that um, are just really are gonna be, need to be uh, fully surplus. And so we also are working with um, our state surplus, my other hat, because there are certain vendors and types and ways that you get rid of those types of material. Um, and so we're, we're looking at a little bit of it. I'm not sure 
um, and I don't even know if we've explored if there's anything that can be sold, but surplus helps us with that because they can figure out if it just needs to be fully disposed of or selling, they have avenues to help us. So we'll be working closely with them as we, from a technical standpoint, probably using some outside entities to help with that assessment. But I think we're still trying to figure it out, um, you know, if, there, if it's out, salvageable in any way. So it's a little bit of all. That's what I expected. I figured that... Any other questions? Yeah. Representative Curtis. I, I just want to echo to what um, Senator Pittman said earlier. Just very impressed with the work that you have done over the past year, you and your team. So it, it's quite amazing. I did have a chance to review the dashboard in advance of today. And that, that too, I'm very impressed with that. That just puts that information at our fingertips. And I'm interested in seeing how that can be. Uh, more usable. So um, I, I'm the ten, the looking ahead ten years just fascinates me. So <laughs> because it's so hard to to visualize what our world's going to be like in ten years, and with technology changing so many things. And um, I, I had a chance to uh, recently have a conversation with Brian McClendon, and he will is one that will blow your mind when he starts talking about how. We're not going to be driving cars in 10 years. We're going to be landing on the roof in our, in our airborne cars. And so I, I'm just, I'm fascinated. So I hope at some point you'll share with us some of those like visioning things that you're looking at in 10 years. I mean, I think we'll come into our desk in the chamber and instead of lugging those darn laptops around, it'll just be a surface, right? And so we'll just, and, and then eventually it just becomes like a, like you have a, and it's a 3D thing that pops up for you. So anyway, I'm, I'm just fascinated at like what the future holds. And but it, with that, we, you know, back to the chairman's like, but do we have the right, you know, infrastructure in the building to actually be able to support it, right? So that's the thing of, I think with some of this work, we don't necessarily know what it's going to look like, but we have to be asking the questions, are we doing things now that create an unintentional barrier or hinder us from being flexible enough to adapt or be in a position to? I mean, the virtual state house was a, a good example. We knew that we were already on track to replace the the switches, but it was a little bit further out. We did it earlier, but even in doing so, we also found out, okay, and we knew some of that we needed more bandwidth in a few different places. You know, So with everything, but as we started to think through that, we were like, okay, so as we move into other places, let's just go in by starting not here and creeping here, but let's just start here, right? And then build from there. So that's the other piece of this that we have to get better at is really using our lessons learned um, this year is a, a great example where we have taken moments and stopped and said, what did we learn? How are we using it? You know, as we start to do things, do we do things differently? Um, what questions were we asking ourselves or trying, what gaps were we trying to fill? And how do we put ourselves in a position in the future that we don't have to do that in a remediation way, but that it's more so of a choice. You can turn this on or you can turn it off. You can utilize it if you need to or not. That is tricky, but I do believe, as I said, amazing team, um, wonderful resources across the state um, that we can leverage into as we have these conversations, um, but we have to have them. We have to stop and take a moment to have those, and then we have to have real conversations, which we will come to you with as well to talk about how does the state invest in this differently, and how do we understand our return on investment that we may not see immediately, but we understand that this is setting us up to do something else, or it's the state is positioning the state to be competitive in a different way, and that's a fully different conversation, but it's still part of the conversation. And I'm not totally sure how to ask this, but so, you know, looking at 10 years, mm -hmm. I mean, the reality is, is most of us won't be here. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're exactly right. I'm, I'm sure including myself. Um, and, you know, a lot of your staff might be, but mm -hmm. even, even some of them won't even be. So when you look at a 10-year plan, you, are you doing it in a way that's interactively, I guess, maybe the right word, so that it doesn't sit on a shelf somewhere and then, you know, in 10 years all of a sudden, oh, yeah, we have this 10-year plan that we put together 10 years ago that somebody else did. How, how are you going to make sure that that is something that is kept up, I guess. I'm not sure how to ask the question. No, it's a great question. We've talked about it internally because I've talked about this idea around 
um, how do we do things institutionally so that it's not, you know, for lack of a better phrase, easily undone, right? What's how do happening? you put, how do you put um, us on a path that we know that um, these steps are taken and it is pushing the state in a particular direction and we've leveraged resources there, but some work unless we have the right partners in place. We can't do some of this work unless we have staff and we are building staff and training so that they have those tools and resources and it's part of a larger map. We also can't do this work and a big part of what happens with many of these conversations and plan is just that, you know, the leaders talk about it and then you write it and then you push it out there. Well, we're doing this from the ground up. So it's going to be the team. It's going to be the staff. We're going to be listening. We're going to be pulling in pieces. We're going to be using stakeholders because okay. we have to come at this where this is something that is that buy-in is essential um, and that we think about can you say like what is happening yeah somebody's mic is on <laughs> that's so weird i think someone's mic is why on. why does this see what i see on slick governor travis okay. it sounds like your mic is on why you see that here <laughs> I think did we did the sounds like they went away. Okay, I think we okay. might be all right now. Um, go ahead. So it is it is going to be about also this is where I go back to the business processes, right? Like what structures need to change operationally, right? Um, um, thinking about how do we mature our IT operations to be reflective of where we're going as well, right? And you build it into the structure. I don't have all the answers, but this is the work that we're gonna try to do, but that's also why the partnership with you all matters because um, I was saying to my team, we have to do a better job of documenting. Like when I ask certain questions, they'll say, go talk to such and such because they were here and remember the conversation between this, I won't name any names, this person and that person that got us there. And it's like, but where's the documentation? Where is that roadmap that showed how you got from here to here and the three decisions that are in between? We have. That's why we're updating policies and we're talking about standards, policies, and procedures and actually defining what that means and who controls them. We had have to have more conversations around, um, you know, pieces of like governance and accountability, and that's some stuff that we don't have much of. That's how you ensure that these things become part of the structures and not reliant on the individual that is driving it. And that's the hope of how we hope to approach this. I appreciate that. I, I think that's one of the things I appreciate about you is that, I mean, I know you've got the IT down, but the administrative part you know, you've really, I think you're, you're changing um, OITS in a, in a good way with that. So, um, oh, and also I wanted to, to thank you for, you know, the rate changes went into effect kind of late. And so a lot of the agencies, it was kind of, a, I don't know if they're surprised for them, but, but their budgets weren't exactly ready for that. And we only had one agency um, that came to us you know, wanting more money because of rate changes. And I, uh, you know, privately had a conversation with them. Why are you the only one? And in the end, we, you know, we did give them the money because we did feel like that they had a valid excuse. But evidently what you did on those rate changes were the right direction because, like I said, we did not have a bunch of them coming to us and saying, oh, we've got all these rate increases that now we need more money. So I appreciate that. Yeah, still work to be done there, but we're making some progress. Any other questions for the secretary? We will see her many times in the next several Thank months. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Secretary. All right. So our last today, we have a, a report from Katrina Osterhaus on um, the biometric identification system. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I realize I'm the only one that stands between you and leaving, so I'm gonna be very, very brief here. Um, just, uh, you know, we are going to go talk about a memorandum that should be in your file. It's a two-pager. It's just a memo. Um, it is dated May 5th, because that's when it was uh, discussed at the LPAC. So find that, I'll be talking about it from that handout. 
So uh, one of our newer statutory objectives within legislative post audit is to monitor IT projects. And in that work, we essentially try to identify if any project is at risk of failure due to either scope, schedule, cost, or quality <laughs> problems. So we have selected and monitored the KBI's automated biometric identification system, or ABIS for short, and we've done this since January 2020. Uh, this project is included in the Keto latest report as planned. So if you go back to the previous discussion that uh, Travis had with you, that's on page 76 if you want to check that out. It is listed as planned because currently it is still in planning mode. We have not entered the execution phase, and I'll talk a little bit about this here uh, next. Um, I'm going to give you a brief update on the project, and again, the two-page uh, document is in front of you. Uh, this project will replace the aging fingerprinting system that KBI and many other state agencies are using and relying on for criminal and non-criminal background checks and justice purposes in general. So as you can see in the memo, the uh, project scope, cost, and security planning is in satisfactory status um, for the quarter ending March 31st. We did determine that the project schedule is in caution status for this quarter, and that is because the estimated timeline to build the information system has been compressed for, from the original milestones that we've been working with. So specifically, the KBI has delayed the project award deadline by more than three months and has shortened the estimated project completion deadline by almost five months from the latest available milestones. At the end of this quarter reporting project, the contract award deadline was moved to May, so that was where the delay came in. So it was moved to May of 2021. And staff did tell us that the contract development and the negotiation required special knowledge, and for this, the KBI did rely on leadership staff, since no dedicated staff positions really exist for that work. This issue does contribute to the delays in awarding the contract. Staff also told us that they extended the contract development timeline to ensure that all specifications, terms, and conditions identified during the negotiations um, were properly identified and included in the contract. Uh, officials did tell us that taking this extra time was necessary, considering the long-term impact that this project will have on the entire state and should reduce the project's overall risk. Once the selected vendor signs off on the revised deadlines, and as this project enters the actual execution phase where the project will be built out, it will be very important uh, to stay on schedule and to reduce the risk of depending on the old fingerprinting system past 2022. And with that, I stand for questions. Committee, any questions? So they still believe they'll have it done by on time. The current schedule shows that that's the plan, yes. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, committee. Um, we have one other item, uh, the minutes from uh, February 23rd, 2001 meeting, which was, was just basically our meeting to um, for... Uh, leadership change, and then we went over um, HB 2188. So is there any changes? Yeah. You got something else? Okay. Any changes or a motion to okay the minutes? Move we approve. It's been moved by, is there a second? It's been seconded by Representative Collins. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. All right. Committee. Be looking, yeah, either one of them. <laughs> Be looking for an email from probably James or, or uh, um, Gary over the next couple months. We're going to try to, um, I'd like to have at least three meetings. Um, you know, we need to have at least um, two more quarterly meetings. And then um, I'd like to have another one in there too where we maybe get a little more in depth in some of, with our, our bill and then also with some of these projects that are, have been approved that we're, we don't really know too much about. And so, and, and we may have another one if we can squeeze, squeeze it in. My ultimate goal though is not to have a meeting in December. I'd like for us to try to be done before December um, so that, uh, and then also um, one of my goals this year too is 
um, Representative Berquist is is sitting in today as a as a get as a uh, in place of Representative Hubert, but he sits on the um, KTEC committee, and so my intention or ITEC, I'm sorry, ITEC, yeah. So my intention is to have him hopefully um, at least once or twice come in at, and um, give us a uh, update on on ITEC. Um, through the to the eyes of a legislature, do you also serve on that, Representative Pittman, um, Senator Pittman? Well, I I normally don't, so I bit you know. That's right. Maybe I can do that, <laughs> but I I do want us to try to um, maybe have a little bit more connection between this committee and ITEC committee. So um, going forward, and um, so uh, unless anybody else has any uh, is. July, does that look pretty good for most everybody, maybe to have another meeting? Um, prob Mid-July, probably, yeah. Senator Peterson. Have we requested dates from LCC? We will do that as soon as um, I get, I sign the letter, I think. Yeah, yeah, so. Probably three. Yeah, let's see, we'd have July and then September and then November, I would say, something like that. Yeah, be, be somewhere in there. And then, like I said, if we would, you know, I, I, in talking to leadership, I think I could maybe squeeze another meeting in from them if, if we um, want to get into some more depth of, of some other stuff. But uh, we'll, we'll just have to see on that, so. Probably we will. I, what I'd like to do in July probably is start looking at some of these, um, some of the uh, uh, these approved projects. We'll also have um, see. We'll have in July. We'll have the second quarter um, reports, and then um, also start looking at the uh, bills that we have kind of setting that we that we want to start looking at and. That's right. We we'll also have LPA audits, so we should have a, a you know enough to keep us busy in July. So, any other questions? Any other concerns? Anything that you would like to see us talk about in the next? Even you, Senator Pittman, if there's something that you'd like to see us talk. About. <laughs> Poor Senator. Um, I, please, please send it to uh, um, actually send to James and then we'll, he'll disseminate um, to me. So, Alan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a quick announcement to you. We're talking about iTech. I want to let you know that June 15th is the next iTech meeting. It's at uh, 1.30 p.m. and it will be a virtual meeting. The agenda should be out soon. If the, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you uh, approve, I can, once that's published, I could send it to the members or send it to you and you could forward it either way. Yeah, that'd be great if you could do that. Okay. Why don't you send it to to, um, to James and then he can send it out there. But okay. okay. Uh, very good. And one of the items I had them put on iTech was cybersecurity insurance. So we're going to be talking about that at iTech. And that may be a subject that this committee wants to discuss too. Cybersecurity cyber insurance? Cybersecurity so like insurance, yes. Okay. All right. The post audit uh, department is looking into it, and we're going to have somebody from uh, Secretary Burns Wallace is getting somebody from uh, NGA and NASIO to come in into ITEC and discuss it. So it should be interesting. Okay. Yeah, and and we might even, you know, if we think it's something we it's real important, we might even have discussion in here, same presentation or something. So yeah, that'd be great. All right. Any other changes? All right. With that, uh, thank you guys for staying. Hey, we got out here before three even. So um, have a good uh, summer and we'll see you all in July. We're adjourned. <laughs>